Hi, welcome back. This is part three of the lecture on parasitology and a survey of some parasitic protozoans. So we're going to start the uh, survey of protozoans right now. So if you take a look um, uh, in your outline, you'll see the beginning of that survey. A couple of things I wanted to address before I get to your outline. This is not on your outline, um, so take a look here. Uh, just some uh, general information about the protozoans. Uh, you knew these first two things, uh, domain eukarya, uh, also classified in the kingdom protista. Now the um, uh, phyla um, at which we'll be looking, we'll look at some representative members of these four phyla, uh, and their names are phylum sarcodina, phylum ciliata, phylum mastigophora, and phylum sporozoa. All right, um, a couple other general facts about the protozoans. They are unicellular, uh, and they are, for the most part, heterotrophic, meaning uh, that they are going to utilize preformed nutrients, uh, with some of the members being autotrophic, meaning uh, capable of photosynthesis. There are some uh, euglenas, for example, that have um, uh, the organelle called chloroplast in them, and they're capable of producing their own nutrients. Uh, okay, also primarily found living in moist environments that could be um, uh, water or moist soil or other um, other areas. And, oh yeah, mostly they're benign. We're going to be concentrating on examples of um, protozoans that are potentially parasitic, but just keep in mind that uh, those are a uh, just a small percentage of all of the protozoans that exist. Okay, now in this section, I think I'm only going to have time to discuss phylum uh, sarcodina, also known as the amoebas. Uh, they move using structures known as pseudopods. That means false foot. It's a, a sort of an extension of cytoplasm uh, in these organisms kind of um, ooze. Uh, through their environments uh, and through their lives. And I've only got one example, there, there are others, but I, I've just got one example in this phylum that I want to discuss with you because I want to discuss it in quite a bit of detail. And that is one whose name has come up before and that's Entamoeba histolytica. Okay, now Entamoeba is the um, cause of a disease known as amoebic dysentery. And just in case you're not clear on the difference between dysentery and diarrhea, dysentery is diarrhea plus blood and mucus. And um, I'm sorry to tell you that I will uh, elaborate on where the blood and the mucus come from as we progress through this lecture. Okay, so Entamoeba histolytica has two stages in its life cycle, the trophozoite and the cyst stage. We've talked about this a couple times already. The cyst is the infectious stage. Infection occurs upon ingestion of the cyst stage. And then uh, the trophozoite will be released. I believe it's um, eight trophozoites per cyst ingested will be released into the uh, safety of the lower GI tract. And the trophozoites are um, active. They move, they feed, they potentially cause uh, damage and symptoms in their, uh, in their patient. Now, um, here's a change in, in my lecture this semester. Uh, what I used to tell my students was that it was estimated that up to 10% of the world's population was infected with Entamoeba histolytica, and uh, that 85 to 95% of those infections were asymptomatic. Okay, new um, research has um, uh, elaborated um, th this particular topic, and um, I'm sorry, where I'm uh, trying to go and not doing a very good, very good job of it is that recent research shows that most of those infections, what I was saying before, the 10% of the world's population infected with entamoeba, most of those infections, 90% of them, it turns out are caused by a close uh, cousin, let's say, of entamoeba histolytica uh, that does not cause symptoms in patients. It's named uh, entamoeba, entamoeba dispar, D-I-S-P-A-R. That's the species name. So that means that only 10% of the original 10%, okay, uh, of humans on planet Earth are infected with Entamoeba histolytica. And how many of those infections are asymptomatic? Uh, I think it might be a little difficult to say with any, any authority on that. 
Okay, so um, ingestion of the cyst through fecal contaminated food or water is typically how the infection occurs. And um, I wanted to mention that while there are other parasitic amoebas, Entamoeba histolytica is the only of those amoebas that is an intestinal parasite in humans. There's a uh, one amoeba that can enter, um, if you are um, swimming in, for example, contaminated water, it can enter um, through uh, ingestion or through your eyes or your sinuses. Uh, they call it the brain-eating amoeba sometimes, but i um, not going to talk about that one right now. Okay, now this is a fairly cosmopolitan parasite, meaning worldwide distribution. However, it is much more common in the tropics than it is in other parts of the world. Um, all right, now when entamoeba is not being invasive, it lives in the, um, the um, uh, mucus lining of the intestines and it feeds on uh, uh, little particles of food and maybe normal flora like bacteria that reside there um, in the intestines. And uh, in other cases, uh, entamoeba will become invasive. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, let's see what else did I want to tell you. Oh yeah, cysts form in the lower intestines. And I mentioned earlier, one cyst will, if ingested by a suitable host, give rise to eight trophozoites. And um, there are different strains of entamoeba and they vary in their uh, pathogenicity. Now, I have some notes that I wrote down when I was um, doing a search. I was looking at the um, Center for Health Protection in Hong Kong. And they said that um, incubation after ingestion of entamoeba histolytica can take anywhere from a few days to several months. Average incubation is uh, two to four weeks. Okay, so let's just go with the average. Let's say two to four weeks after an individual ingests um, entamoeba cysts, that's when they may uh, start to become symptomatic. One more thing before I get into the symptoms. Some people that live in parts of the world, or I should say many, or if not most people that live in parts of the world where entamoeba histolytica is endemic, meaning present in the population at all time. Um, over a period of many generations, that population may develop what's called um, um, innate, um, or um, sometimes we call it even, um, I think herd immunity would work here as well. Here's what I mean. Uh, that population, those folks, have been exposed to entamoeba histolytica generation after generation after generation, and so the population develops some uh, immunity against entamoeba histolytica. So entamoeba is not nearly as likely to become invasive in those individuals with that innate or generational immunity. It would be people that uh, travel from other areas where their uh, their population has not been exposed to entamoeba histolytica, uh, that when they acquire the protozoan, those are the people that are more likely uh, to develop symptoms. All right, so let's talk about the symptoms. They include dysentery, um, abdominal pain and gas, and when entamoeba is invasive, it produces what are called, I just want to see if this is in your notes, uh, no, I guess it's not. It produces what are called proteolytic enzymes, P-R-O-T-E-O-L-Y-T-I-C, proteolytic enzymes. What those enzymes do is literally digest host tissue. Now, um, so remember, entamoeba was living in the, the mucus lining of the intestines, so starts to produce these proteolytic enzymes, literally is going to digest um, one or more holes uh, in, that, um, in those tissues and um, actually move outside of the intestinal area into surrounding tissues like ligaments, muscles, um, blood vessels, right? And I'm saying that specifically. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and so, um, what we're going to see is the formation of these um, lesions uh, beginning in the intestinal lining and then um, moving out into progressing into supporting tissues called um, amoebomas. And there's um, a, a picture of them, um, of one of those uh, in your lecture notes, described as being roughly a flask 
shaped lesion, you know, like a flask, uh, like an Erlenmeyer flask that you might see in chemistry. Okay, so anyway, so back to symptoms. So we had dysentery, we had abdominal pain and gas, we had um, invasion of host tissues due to the production of proteolytic enzymes and the formation of those amoebomas. Now, now we have one or more open lesions in the intestinal lining. Not so good. Uh, they're going to bleed. Okay, there's the blood in our diarrhea. And one of the, a couple of the ways that the body is going to react to irritations, let's say, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the GI tract, one is to um, increase the speed at which we move things through, uh, and that would be the diarrhea. Uh, and it would also be to increase mucus production to, to try to kind of wash away whatever the offender is. So there's your blood and your mucus in your dysentery. All right, so we have these um, open lesions in the intestinal lining that's going to lead to the next symptom, which would be secondary infection of those lesions by the bacteria that are normal flora of the, um, of the intestines. Uh, this is going to be accompanied by a fever. Um, and then the next symptom is called hepatomegaly. And again, I'm looking to see what you have in your notes. Um, hepatomegaly, H-E-P-A-T-O-M-E-G-A-L-Y. It refers to a swollen and tender liver. And what I mean by that is this. Now remember I mentioned entamoeba um, may um, damage host tissues, including blood vessels. Well, entamoeba may actually enter the circulatory system through some of those blood vessels and be carried to other parts of the body. It can uh, wind up in pretty much any number of organs, but seems to have an affinity for the liver. Uh, sometimes it's found in the lungs as well. Ooh, not a good situation. Uh, so those proteolytic enzymes are still being produced in the liver, causing destruction of liver tissue, which is going to cause the liver to swell and be very tender. That's called hepatomegaly. All right, so those are the symptoms. All right, now I'll bet you'd like to know how to not become infected with entamoeba histolytica. First of all, the old expression, don't drink the water, is probably the best advice you can get. If you're traveling somewhere where the uh, quality of the drinking water is questionable, you've got to be really careful and really thoughtful. Best thing to do is to drink commercially bottled water. Um, if not uh, uh, available, you could um, boil the water at least 10 minutes. Uh, you could treat the water with um, a chlorine bleach. Um, Google it. Uh, there's a formula for how many drops of bleach per gallon of water, depending on the condition of the water. Uh, you could also treat the water with iodine tablets. Those are available in, um, I think, like backpacking stores. And all of those um, would make the water safe to drink. So careful about drinking the water, but you've got to go even further than that because let's say you drink safe water, but you pour it into a, um, a glass that was washed in contaminated local water, or you added ice cubes, or you eat fresh fruits or vegetables that were either washed in or watered in or whatever in contaminated water, any of those things, um, the cyst might be present and you could potentially become infected. So just be thoughtful about what you eat or drink when you travel in areas where water uh, quality is questionable. So don't drink the water. Uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, I already talk about the, talked about those. You should be careful. Um, they, they may be a potential source of infection. And if you know you're traveling to an area where entamoeba might be an issue, talk to your physician about that and he or she might be willing to prescribe um, a, a drug called uh, metronidazole or flagyl. Um, it's one of the drugs used to treat the infection. I'll, I'll get to that next. Uh, but um, you may be um, given a low dose of that to take while you're traveling to use as a prophylactic uh, against infection. But you still need to take the other precautions. All right, so how do we diagnose this? Um, we're going to... Um, uh, the most direct way is to look for the presence of trophozoites and or cysts in fecal samples. There are antibody tests uh, that can be done as well to determine if antibodies against entamoeba are present in the patient's uh, serum. Okay, let's talk about treatment, and it looks like you've got most of that info in your notes. Uh, as I mentioned before, flagyl metronidazole, same drug. You should know both names, you guys. Um, treat, and and you've got some notes here. Now, um, when we're treating parasitic protozoan infections, 
because these are also eukaryotic organisms, the drugs that have an adverse effect on them may also have an adverse effect on us. Now, Flagyl is a very versatile drug. It's used for a lot of things. Um, it can be used to treat certain bacterial infections. But in those cases, the dose is relatively low and the course is um, relatively short. But to successfully treat this type of parasitic uh, infection, the dose will be high and the course uh, quite a bit longer. I've got some notes um, in your outline, uh, 750 milligrams of uh, flagell three times a day for five to 10 days. Uh, that's pretty high dose. And when used in that way, flagell is a potential, I am not saying likely people, a potential carcinogen or cancer causing agent. Um, now let's reason through this, okay? Let's say we have two patients, we happen to know that they're both infected with Entamoeba histolytica. This patient has no symptoms, this patient has um, dysentery and hepatomegaly. Which patients are we going to treat? Well, we're not going to treat the asymptomatic patient, right? Do no harm, right? Uh, but of course, we have a patient that has dysentery, chronic dysentery, hepatomegaly, other uh, damages, uh, types of damage are likely as well. That's the patient we need to treat. So we just need to weigh uh, the benefit to the potential harm to the patient. Okay, um, I've got some other notes in there about treatments. Uh, we can follow the treatment with flagell or metronidazole with another drug called um, uh, paramomycin, uh, and I've got some dosage information there. All right, I'm gonna call it good for this section. When I come back, we'll pick it up with phylum mastigophora. I have several examples in that phylum, uh, so I'll probably just do like one segment on that phylum. All right, guys, as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.